see if this one moves along. Um, okay, so the web today is increasingly visual with hundreds of billions of photographs interleaved with natural language descriptions. And what it means is um, more opportunities for language grounding for NLP research and also deeper image understanding for computer vision. And what's really exciting about this data in the wild is that um, it really reflects the rich spectrum of descriptive language that people use in their daily online activities. And uh, for example, some people say something simple and literal like a butterfly and flower, but some people want to say something more interesting. For example, a butterfly feeding on a flower, attracted to flowers sipping nectar from the flower, and even a butterfly having lunch. So this is a figurative language. Um, so, tapping on this data um, that's readily available in a very large quantity, um, the goal of this study is to describe image content using the kind of rich, highly expressive language that people use in their casual um, online activities. And this could potentially be useful for describing images for visually impaired or uh, for text-only web browsing and also for enabling complex image search with lang uh, natural language queries. Uh, quick overview on the related work in this domain. Uh, there are different ways of organizing the related work, but one way to do this is to project them over this horizontal line. Um, on the left-hand side are those approaches that generate uh, descriptions using only those content words for which we have visual detectors. Um, so by definition, these will um, make use of a fixed small vocabulary and involve relatively simpler formulaic language. Uh, on the right-hand side are those approaches that utilize naturally existing uh, descriptions in, on the internet. So it's almost like a text-to-text -text generation, and they naturally involve more expressive language. These are naturally more uh, noisier as well. So um, uh, there has been relatively less work done uh, on the right-hand side and more work done on the left-hand side, and there has been something in between as well. Um, as a concrete example, given a photograph like this, a system sitting on this left-hand side that only wants to make use of words, content words for which we have visual detectors might describe, um, might generate something like this. And this is by and large germane to the image content, um, but it's fairly robotic and it's not very inviting to read. Um, in comparison to the human written captions, uh, which generally uh, make use of more expressive phrases such as performing a trick or leaping in the air. Um, but the problem is that we don't really have a visual detectors for interesting verb phrases such as this. So then the question is, how can we reduce the gap between these two? Can we ever reduce this gap? Um, another way of phrasing this question is, can we scale up the range of descriptive words and phrases uh, for image captioning? Um, especially faced with this long-standing computer vision challenge that we don't really have large-scale descriptive verb recognizers, um, among others. So reflecting on the prior literature, it seems that we have tried, or there have been a significant amount of efforts in which the set of what can be described is basically defined by the set of what can be recognized. And this set is defined by humans. And the hope was that um, we start with a small and precise set, and we gradually increase the set until we become very large scale. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, and this might have been the only option we had, uh, let's say in 1995, when the web looked like this. Um, hardly no image, just lots of text. Hard to believe Amazon once looked like this. Um, but things changed, now we have this. So maybe we can try something else as well. 
something slightly different in which the set of what can be described could be substantially larger than the set of what can be recognized. And we start with such a noisy set and then try to gradually reduce that noise. So that's what we are going to try to do today. Um, in fact, there have been some emerging efforts of this nature, but in this work, we try to push it a little bit further. And the reason why this might be possible is that the data can decide this set of what can be described because we might be able to um, rely on distributional hypotheses across different modalities. So the idea is that uh, if we have a similar images, even if we don't understand everything in the image, uh, just because we have seen a certain kind of textual information associating with a certain kinds of visual information, we might be able to say something adequate, even if we don't really understand what those mean. So as an operational overview, um, the system is sort of like two-step approach. Uh, the first, uh, sorry, given a query image, we first harvest a bunch of potentially useful tree branches from a forest of one million image caption pairs. And then we are going to compose the image description by combining some of these useful tree branches. Um, so the first step is this uh, phrase collection phase, which I'm not going to go into too much of detail because this is largely based on what we had in our earlier system in 2012. Um, roughly speaking, we collect four different types of phrases. Um, given the query image, the first type of phrases are noun phrases that contain the object that is detected. So this is where the visual detectors are more reliable. And then we also collect verb phrases which are um, attached to the noun phrase which contain the object that's detected. And by the way, we are avoiding the use of verb detectors at the moment because we don't have a lot of visual detectors that can supply with uh, all these verb phrases. So the idea is that, well, if the object looked similar, then maybe people are talking about the object using the kind of verb phrases that could be comparable to the image content. So that's the assumption there. Um, the third type of phrases are uh, based on the stuff detector. These are generally something to do with mass nouns, such as water, grass, sky, that doesn't have rigid boundaries. And usually these um, appear in prepositional phrases in natural language descriptions. And then the fourth type would be uh, based on global scene similarity. And examples include in the countryside or at the pool party or at the conference and so forth. So we have uh, plenty of um, phrases to choose from. And then now in order to compose a sentence, we're going to select a subset of these harvested phrases. And then uh, we need to think about how we want to order some of these or maybe we want to even drop uh, one of these phrases or two of the, so we don't have to use all of this uh, four. And at this point, these phrases are in fact tree fragments because we, uh, we ran the parse trees. Um, so in order to compose a sentence, we uh, first want to think about whether we can build a nice tree on the top. And um, so that's global sentence structure. We also want to make sure that um, if we just read off the leaf level nodes, then it should read nicely. So that will be an ngram based language model. And this is different from parsing because we need to consider different choice of uh, phrases simultaneously while we also want to think about reordering. So um, it's a MB hard problem because reordering itself is hard and then adding the tree structure on the top doesn't make the problem any easier. And so we formulated this problem as constraint optimization uh, using integer linear programming. And so very briefly, uh, what we need to do is um, decide some, uh, sorry, introduce some decision variables. And what this one does is that uh, if um, i the phrase from j the phrase type has been selected for the slot k equals young, uh, zero. So um, this, uh, if this one is assigned as one, that means um, we will reward the selection using content selection score that comes from visual detection confidence. And then uh, we also want to make sure that the phrases uh, read nicely across the phrase boundaries. So we also introduce pairwise decision variables 
which we then use in order to uh, add another term that has um, language model scores in it. And so if we can stop here and add maybe a little bit more constraints, and then we have something that already starts generating something reasonable, but we can keep going and build the trees on the top. Um, to do that, we um, need to introduce additional variable. So um, this one, what it, uh, the beta is for assigning um, non-terminal node in one of these uh, tree uh, cells um, that we are considering. And once we have that, we can also introduce this trinary variable that uh, encodes whether a particular product rule has been um, uh, used. And then once we have that, then we can also add the third term to the objective function that uh, reverse this global parse tree structure. So as a quick recap, uh, we just, um, at a high level, we have uh, three different terms in the objective function, uh, content selection that has something to do with the visual recognition score, and then sequen sequential cohesion has something to do with engram-based language model, and then tree structure comes from PCFG model. And at this point, uh, there's no reason why the uh, ILP assignment will be something uh, consistent across these alpha, beta variables, which have something to do with the sequence variables and tree structure. So we need to throw in some additional constraints in order to make sure that um, the assignment makes sense. But once we've done that, uh, we can start evaluating. Um, by the way, this is only a part of the full system, but let's take a look what happens in terms of evaluation. So. If we add tree structure, then the score improves, and this is a blue score. We are borrowing this evaluation measure from machine translation, imagining that this is a translation from images to text. And um, here are some half successful examples deliberately chosen. Um, so these captions read off reasonable at the beginning, and then it gets a little bit strange toward the end. For example, there's no reason to believe what if this dog was in Des Perez in Herman Park on May 13, 2008. Um, not very plausible. So um, the idea, the observation here is that um, these harvested phrases naturally contain too much of noise. So we want to reduce this noise. And in order to do that, um, we are going to, before harvesting tree branches, now we are going to clean up the forest first by pruning tree branches a lot. And then we, are, we can repeat the same thing that we've done so far. So uh, in order to do that, we um, model this task as image caption generalization. Um, uh, uh, and then we do tree compression for this. There could be different ways of doing it, but we've done it this way. And for the optimization, we consider visual salience and sequence cohesion and tree structure similarly as before. But um, in this case, in order to um, delete some of these branches, we need to do a little bit of a reparsing so that um, things become valid parse tree later. Um, but this one can be done using dynamic programming, um, and this is slight bit of modification to the CKY parsing. And so, at this point, the evaluation, if we look at the evaluation, then the numbers look nicer than before after pruning the trees. Um, I should also mention that if we look at Meteor score, then the numbers are not, um, it's still similar, there's some similar trend, but not as nice as before. So it's slightly inconclusive uh, based on the automatic evaluation measures, and this has been a little bit of a concern in um, image caption generations. So we also do the human evaluation to see um, which one is indeed better. And so in this setting, we are asking uh, Amazon Mechanical Turkers to decide which one is better among the two choices that are present, presented at uh, random. And 73% of the times, people preferred the caption generated by the last uh, method. And then similarly, um, it seems that uh, the models that contain tree structure are preferred over the counterpart about 70% of the times. And then between the version with and without pruning, the one with pruning is preferred 63% uh, of the time. And then finally, 
uh, just for fun, we also ask um, Turkers to see whether they prefer machine captions or the original Flickr caption. I should mention that Flickr captions are noisy, so um, in a way it uh, makes it slightly easier for us to beat human captions. Um, our previous system was able to beat about 16% of the time. I think it's largely because the original Flickr captions were also bad. But now we are able to beat uh, the original human caption about one out of the four times, so, so that's actually quite exciting. And if we look at the system-generated captions, they actually do look good this time. So here are some examples. Uh, the flower was so vivid and attractive. Uh, we don't really have a visual recognizer so that can give us words like vivid and attractive. Now we can do this. Um, blue flowers are running rampant in my garden. This is beyond even my capability of generation. So um, by copying over what other people wrote in the internet, um, the system is able to do better than what I can do. Um, though this window depicts the church. That's an interesting uh, verb choice. The duck sitting in the water happens to be correct um, because visually, uh, probably what else can the duck do? Um, so. Here are even more interesting examples. Um, these are the cases when machine captions were preferred over human captions. These are machine captions. Some are poetic uh, and situationally rele relevant. Human captions are not bad either, but um, ours sometimes are preferred over theirs. Sometimes, even when ours is good, sometimes the human captions are preferred, so it's just a um, fair comparison. Uh, in any case, this is what we have. Of course, we sometimes make uh, pretty bad mistakes. These are, these are better mistakes, by the way. They're also worse ones. But I'm going to show you somewhat better ones. So my cat laying in my duffel bag. There's not much we can do when the visual detectors give us something like cat for tiger and the duffel bag for the body of the tiger. I guess there's some visual similarities. Um, or this couch, it's actually a castle, um, and so forth. And then um, uh, other silly mistakes, a cat looking for a home, the other cats are making the computer room. This could be true, but who knows. Um, the castle known for being the home of Hamlet in the Shakespeare ba play. Uh, I don't know what that should look like, but probably not like this, so. It's on the other side, the girl. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so to conclude, um, um, in this work, I presented a data-driven approach to automatic image captioning in which the key idea was, what if we start with the set of what can be described that's just so uh, much larger than what can be recognized today with the state of the art computer vision techniques, and then try to reduce this noise? I don't think I've reduced it uh, well enough just yet, but it's just still generating something reasonable one out of the four times. I think we can do much better than this. And this general direction has been relatively less explored than the other counterpart. And our experimental results suggest that this may be a useful, uh, fruitful avenue to explore more. Um, that's it. Uh, questions? Very interesting talk. I have just a very small question. The first is uh, synth uh, matching and decouple thing because like it's one of the most important component of your system, right? You have the uh, training data, you have to decompose it into the small fragment and then you match it with the uh, training data to find the phrase, that's the first question. The second question is about evaluation because now your task is try to make the caption interesting. So your evaluation should measure the interestingness of your caption, not blue. Blue is just like from the reference and matching word by word, but not capturing the interestingness. Do you have any comment for that? Okay, so the first question, I think it was something about the computer vision details, which I may or may not have the answer uh, fully, but uh, that 
slide might be a little too far away. But um, so when we are doing this uh, object detection, we are not doing based on like uh, precise segmentation. It's just a bounding boxes, and we have the uh, like fixed number of objects to begin with. So in fact. Um, we are sort of confined by that set of objects. We could have gone probably more than that. Um, and these object detectors were trained uh, from data set that's entirely separate from this particular data set that we were playing with. Um, does that answer your first question? Okay, so the answer is we limit the suspect, right? So you limit just, uh, so the answer is you limit to some specific object so that the system can perform well on that subject. Right, right. so um, at least for the system to get started at all, we were starting with object detectors and um, potentially we could use as many object detectors as possible and there has been recent uh, like very exci exciting improvements in terms of object detectors. Now, um, Beyond that, we have also attribute and verbs, and those are still ongoing research challenge. Um, so for those parts, we were filling in with basically language models of some sorts. Um, and the second, quest second question, I think, was about um, have we measured the interestingness of generated captions? And um, we have not. Uh, we're just enjoying reading some of these captions, but maybe we should have done, uh, ask that questions as well. In fact, that was not our explicit goal uh, in this study initially, but this was just um, uh, something that we accidentally found. Um, it's really largely because this is how people write out there, and we're just copying from how people write. But uh, this current model doesn't try to sound more interesting. It just accidentally does it. It seems to me that you're just saying natural language generation works better with trees. Because partly you rely on the information the vision research gives you about object detection. And you just turn this into trees and put together to form a phrase, generate a phrase to describe the picture. So is that, do you agree? Um, so one thing that maybe I could mention, so the question was, um, I. Uh, Seems like something to do with the trees, like how much does it help for this type of task? Um, the answer is the following. So unlike a lot of text-to-text -to -text, um, generation tasks that people have looked at, here we don't really have, uh, um, like for example, for machine translation, you have one sentence that pretty much represents the meaning quite well, and then you can anchor on that. Um, you can rely on that. For summarization, for sentence fusion, again, you have some sentences that you could rely on. In our case, we don't have anything. We are sort of composing things from a set of completely disparate sentences, and then we're trying to find some reasonable composition uh, out of them. And one way why we are like, getting away with some of, like, um, even with the relatively simple model, we're being able to generate something reasonable is because we only allow four different types of phrases and, and then we also make sure that tree structures are reasonable. Um, but in order to really lift these sort of assumptions, we somehow need to have a better model for generation that could somehow constrain things better. Um, one more? So do you think, so you said at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned verb detection. Right. And then later you said, we're not going to do that. Because there's nothing that yeah. really works at this. Um, you blame the vision people uh, because oops. they don't give uh, you verbs. But I, th I thought maybe you can get away with that because if you use a distributional hypothesis and you know the objects, then you can just retrieve the verbs that were most frequently used to connect those things. Right, so that's basically what we're doing. In fact, maybe we shouldn't even be blaming vision people because 
if we actually really think about some of these verbs, there's no way to know this just visually. A lot of these verbs are very, very contextual. Um, so maybe this is more like a common problem. Maybe it's a slight, maybe this is some problem that we need to solve together. Yeah, maybe natural language processing is helping vision. Uh, going the other way around. Yeah. yeah, and I hope that they will help us too. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>